Some areas around the house are easy to clean, but it's often the out of sight jobs that are the hardest. One of the most challenging aspects of deep cleaning these spaces is the buildup of grime over time. Air vents that haven't been cleaned in roughly half a century require special tools, for example, and a roof that's covered in nearly three decades of moss calls for a skilled technician. Neglecting these spaces can have consequences. The accumulation of debris in these hard-to-reach areas can cause structural damage, spark fires, or even induce health hazards. Watch as eight specialists share expert tips of the trade and explain what it takes to deep clean decades of household grime. Duct Heroes is an air duct cleaning company in Illinois. Many of its clients have never done a single air duct cleaning, and today's job is no exception. These vents haven't been cleared of dust and debris for a century. As soon as we walked in, we see the old vents, the furnace, how old it was. Before even opening any of the vents up, I knew how bad it was going to be. You know, he said 47 years of dust, probably over 100 years, to be honest. If you look at a vent and you see dust on the actual vent, that's a clear sign that the ducts have probably never been cleaned and they're pretty filthy inside. Uh, we like to start on the very top of the house and work our way down. That tool that we're using, uh, we call it whiskers. Um, the whiskers are just made out of rubber. The end of it's attached to an air compressor and you have air just coming out through the rod out the little whisker things. So what you're looking at right now is just me pulling chunks of dust out that have probably been in there for over 100 years. There was too much dust to be putting it in the vacuum. Um, so I literally went in there with my hands and grabbed probably like five pounds of dust. Isn't it gnarly? Like, look at how much dust that is. It's just so sick, honestly. This is the back of the dryer, uh, and you guys can pretty much see there's an endless amount of lint coming out. There's a few reasons why you should get your dryer vent cleaned. It's a huge fire hazard and your clothes will dry more efficiently. It's well worth the money to just pay to get it cleaned every year. The vacuum is on throughout the whole process. Uh, and what we're doing is blowing all that dust and debris closer and closer to the vacuum. This house in particular had 18 vents. Most of the time, I think probably 75% of the time, the houses that we go to have never been cleaned. Um, people just don't think about it, you know, they, Getting your air ducts clean isn't like a regular thought that comes to your, you know, head. The dust you typically see in your vents is, most of it is actually uh, human skin cells. Yeah, it's pretty gnarly. So right now we're done and everything's pretty much good to go. Um, you're pretty much going to see a brand new home, honestly. Uh, you're gonna feel much better. Uh, your health is gonna be better. I actually got a phone call after that job and they said all, all their allergies went away. It, it's just a huge health benefit, honestly. Uh, you might not notice like the small stuff, but your body does. Moving underground, there are the sewage pipes which after heavy use are in need of significant cleaning and repairs. Instead of digging underground or having to do any demolition to replace or clean sewage pipes, Kenneth Kaz cures them from the inside. He's a plumber from Norway who specializes in pipe relining. 
This blue tube you're seeing is being pushed through a faulty sewage pipe using pressurized air, which will create a tough new pipe inside of the old one. This technique can be used to fix cracked, leaky, or old pipes. Some signs that a pipe needs to be inspected include sewer odors, slow drains, and constant clogs. Pipe relining is a quicker method compared to replacements, and it only takes two workers to complete the job. Workers start by inspecting the inside of the pipe with a tiny camera. They're looking for any cracks or leaks. Once they assess the damage, they'll clean the pipe with water and a rotating chain. This breaks up any caked on rust, dirt, hair, sewage, and oil inside the pipe. All this buildup shrank the size of the pipe, making it difficult for waste to flow through it. Now that all that waste has been removed, the pipe is back to its original size, which will allow the new lining to stick. Now the relining process begins. The workers measure the pipe and cut a piece of felt lining to roughly the same size. A vacuum pump sucks out any air from inside the felt so that it can be filled with epoxy resin. They mix the resin by hand. Now that there's no room for air bubbles, which weaken the resin, they fill it up. Epoxy resin is super strong and resistant to chemicals. It's also a good choice to prevent roots of trees or plants from getting in the pipes and clogging them. And since resin starts as a liquid, it can be used to repair pipes of any size. The team flattens the lining and puts it in a compressor. The compressor uses pressurized air to shoot the lining into the old pipe. Once it's in there, the lining is inflated so that it sticks to the walls. A new pipe starts to form inside the old one. It cures and hardens for four hours with the help of pressurized air and heat from a steamer. Then the lining is deflated, trimmed, and removed, leaving behind a new pipe inside. The pipes can be used as normal once the job is done, and no water will be able to get in between the liner and the original pipe. The finished product can last over 50 years, which is twice as long as a brand new PVC pipe. Gutters are some of the most important things to keep clean, especially before winter. I'm Broden and I own a business in Connecticut called The Gutter Guys. Today I'm going to show you how to clean gutters with wet and dry debris. So when we clean a gutter with wet debris, nine times out of 10, we want to clean it by hand. The reason why is when it's wet, it typically is very muddy and there's a lot of what we call shingle dust or grit in the gutters and it's literally a mud. And when we blow them, when they are wet, it makes a muddy mess all over the house. We want to clean them by hand for that reason. So that is a gutter that is completely jammed with leaves and debris and the downspout was completely covered. When we released the debris out of the downspout and got that gutter cleaned, all of that rainwater that was in the gutter just started to flow very heavily right down the downspout, as it should. So oftentimes when we do a gutter cleaning, not only do we find leaves, but we find plants so big that we actually call them trees sometimes growing right out of a gutter. We're actually pulling out a big plant and you can see the whole root system come right out with it. Certain types of trees give off these little things that come off the tree and will grow another tree. And when those land in the gutter, it's a perfect environment for that to grow. 
It's a classic sign that your gutters have not been cleaned in years. It also puts a significant amount of weight from the whole root system growing in the gutter on the gutter which in turn will pull that gutter off of the fascia board, which is actually the board behind the gutter that the gutter is mounted to. Wet debris is usually just saturated with water. Water will overflow at the gutter and get into your basement and create cracks in your foundation. Once water does find its way into your basement, it wreaks havoc. Here, the water that's flowing out of the downspout at the bottom is the end result that we are looking for. So that water will flow down and out as it properly should. When we see dry debris, the reason why that debris is dry is because there has not been any rain in the past, I would say, week or so. So when we clean a gutter that has dry debris, oftentimes we will use a hand blower and blow those gutters out because it does a really good job of just getting everything out of the gutter, whether it be leaves or sticks or, or curly stuff that comes off in the spring. Depending on the pitch of the roof, we will get on that roof, start our hand blower and walk across that roof line, hand blowing out all of the debris out of that gutter. Sometimes the debris is very compact and it's thick. That's a classic sign of maybe a couple of years that somebody had not had their gutters cleaned. We stick to one type of ladder and that's an aluminum ladder. The aluminum ladder does conduct electricity so it's very important we stay away from power lines when we are moving aluminum ladders. We could get severely electrocuted, it's certainly deadly. Which is why we mark the power line areas with flags before we start a gutter cleaning because you're looking where you're walking so you don't look up to see the power lines. So it's very important for us to have a reminder that the power lines are there. We will often drop a penny down the downspout just to know that that downspout's free and clear because we can see and hear it go all the way through and back out at the bottom. And we know that we're in good shape. The best advice I can give a homeowner is to be proactive and not reactive. Typically when you're reactive, it's too late. Damage has been done. The water may already be in your basement. It may already be in your home. And it's just not a good way to maintain your house. Water is seriously detrimental to your house and the main cause of water is from your gutters. So if you keep the gutters free and clear and you do consistent cleaning, whether it be two or three times per year, which we recommend, you will never have any issues with water in your basement or ruining your flower beds or rotting out the fascia and soffits of your home. Just stay on top of gutter cleaning. Perhaps even worse than a clogged gutter full of leaves is a pool that hasn't been cleaned for six years. Watch as Miles Laplin cleans out one of the dirtiest pools he's ever seen. All right then, I had a DM come through. Can I help sort out this pool? Which actually looks more like a pond, I know. I was half expecting to see a fish swimming around in the bottom. There was plants growing in there, like pond plants. They thought maybe like, like when they were cutting the grass and they had the doors open, maybe little bits blew in and like seeds or whatever just went into the water and see bits start growing and stuff. So maybe like that, but who knows? We're gonna empty it and clean it out. Dropping in the submersible pump first and we'll be back the next day. Nice and empty, but not nice and clean. Time to get to work. I'm gonna jump in and have a look at the damage first. Yeah, so once the pool was empty, um, we brushed them in, into a corner of a mass, with a big brush, um, shoveled them out into a bucket and threw it on their compost heap. The main difference between cleaning an indoor and an outdoor pool is normally you don't get any sort of debris in an indoor pool. Obviously, this one had plants growing in it. It took about five, five or six years for this pool to get like that. But for an outdoor pool, that would probably only take maybe a year, year and a half for it to get like that state. So before we emptied the pool, this was actually floating. So when we emptied it, it sort of like the plants had like started attaching themselves to the wall. Then jet washing the walls and the floor. Quickly have a guess at what pictures tiled in on the floor. 
I went for a dolphin. Turns out it's a sea lion. That's pretty cool there. It's coming up nicely, but there's still some stains left over. So what we're going to do is mix up some acid in a bucket of water. Scrub that all over the floor and walls. Then we're going to jet wash the surround. Jump back in the pool, rinse that down. Get the big hoover out, start hoovering up all the last little bits. Um, so that is a chlorine dispenser and you can fill that up with the chlorine tablets and it slowly dissolves the tablets feeding chlorine into the pool. You could fill up the chlorine feeder with the tablets but it won't give your pool instant chlorine. You'd then put in the granules to give it that initial chlorine dose and then the tablets will slowly dissolve bringing up the chlorine level as well. That is, um, well, some people think it's me adding colour to the pool. <laughs> is that what makes the pool look blue, is what some people me uh, message me. Um, but actually it's algicide, and that is to prevent um, the growth of algae. Uh, so that is a jelly cube, and it's a water clarifier. Also, it removes phosphates from the pool. Um, and helps with chemical efficiency. What it does is help put like a layer, pick up small particles, therefore making the pool a bit clearer. When you initially put salt in a pool, a freshly filled pool, it will take around a week for the salt to be generated into chlorine itself. And the process is called electrolysis. It looked as if it had just been finished from like new build. The tiles were like nice and blue, nice and white tiles, very clean looking. A um, hundred times better than what it did when I turned up. This was all within maybe half a day's work. I mean, I've seen green indoor pools, but never an indoor pool with anything growing other than a little bit of algae. A home's exterior is best cleaned with a good power washer. My name is AJ Joyner, owner of Advanced Pressure Washing, LLC. Today we're going to show you how we clean the exterior of a client's dirty home, step by step. We, in general, we offer exterior cleaning, but the main services in the residential field are house washing, gutter clean out, uh, concrete cleaning. Those are the main ticket items that we solicit to the residential clients. The condition of the fence structurally is great, but as you can see, it's covered in mildew and algae. Wood is very particular because if you uh, use too much pressure, they're gonna cause a lot of damage to the surface. So to treat it, we just use water. We actually use moderate pressure. And we make sure always to go with the grain. This keeps us from furring slash damaging the wood. The driveway is terrible, covered in mildew and algae. The chemicals we normally use is called sodium hypochlorite, 12.5%, or better known as pool shock slash industrial bleach. Uh, we normally dilute that down to a 50-50 ratio in our buckets. This kills the mildew and algae, that top layer when we pre-treat. It kills it almost instantly. This is called a Whisper Wash Big Boy Surface Cleaner. That metal tubing uh, actually rotates a round on a swivel. That's the item that, that I use to actually clean concrete. The 
from there, we'll actually go around washing the trim of, around the brick and other areas the surface cleaner couldn't reach. Uh, and then we will post treat with the detergent again to get any organic stains that are left behind. Uh, after we do the driveway, we'll then do the uh, front patio and sidewalk. Uh, also, sometimes if the client wants, we'll also do the curbs along the drive. The house is in pretty good condition, but there was a few spots that we noticed that were pretty bad with heavy and thick mildew and algae. Uh, on a house, we use roughly about 10% sodium hypochlorite uh, mixed with about 90% water. So the black on the brick is actually mildew, just really thick mildew and algae. Uh, this is caused by moisture uh, and shade, allowing for such thick mildew and algae to grow. When we wash the house's exterior, we wash the roof, the outside, the gutters, the side of the home, the windows, the doors, anything that is on the side or attached to the home itself. So we're finished. We finally got the job done. Uh, so roughly this job took us about uh, four and a half hours. Everything looks amazing. The client was beyond happy with the job that we have done. You can clearly see everything is transformed into a new clean state. My personal suggestion, instead of trying to do it yourself, is to always hire a professional because you're dealing with some very strong and dangerous chemicals uh, and it can become dangerous when in the hands of someone not experience. Next up, Sid Partridge of Partridge Exterior Cleaning in the UK walks us through what it takes to remove moss from a roof that hasn't been touched in nearly three decades. Here I'm beginning to scrape the roof, so I'm trying to remove as much moss as possible. This is what I'll be doing for the bulk of the day, and this is the hardest part of the job. I have the tool that I use, it's basically a flat metal blade uh, angled to one side which means I can get the edge of the tile which usually carries a lot of the moss and scrape the bulk surface of the tile at the same time. I use sort of a side to side motion and it is very taxing on the body so it takes a long time to build up the endurance and strength to do it. So on this roof you'll see a lot of brown and green. This is the moss, you'll also see a lot of white spots people think is fur droppings but this is white lichen. Moss is terrible for roofing and roof materials, especially in the UK, as we get a lot of damp weather over here. So it just tends to grow and fester more and it will grow in between the cracks of the tiles. Now when you have hot weather turn into cold weather, the moss will freeze and expand and then end up cracking the roof tiles, which can create holes, leaks and things like that in the roof. So this part of the job where I'm on the scaffolding was the hardest. So I use a 40 feet extendable pole with the scraper attached on the end and I was almost at max extension. So the scraper itself is quite heavy and the pole itself is quite heavy. So having that out at a near horizontal level for a couple of hours is very difficult. And as soon as this was done, I was relieved and happy to move on to the next part. So what I'm cleaning here is a four bedroomed house. It's got big flat concrete tiles. So these are some of the best tiles to come across to clean. The surface area of them, and because they're completely flat, it's very easy to get the moss off. You do not get roofs better than this. So it's rare that you'll actually get away with using a broom to clean a roof, as usually the moss is very, very stuck on and it's typically just used for cleaning up. However, on this job, the moss was coming off easy. So in certain sections, it can just be easier just to try and sweep off a majority and then sort of fine tune it with a scraper. So the typical cleaning chemicals that I use in my roof cleaning work is a chemical called a biocide. 
Uh, what this essentially will do is destroy any of the organic growth left on the roof and it has a residual cleaning effect once I'm gone as well. So there's no rinsing it off, you leave it on the roof to fully dry and soak into the tiles. This will get anything that we can't get to by scraping, so anything that's left in the gaps, any sort of really stubborn stains and marks that are left on the tiles also will slowly degrade. So the brush that I'm using here is a basic water fed pole that most window cleaners would use. That's all you need, it's got four jets in it which will fire out the chemical mixed with the water onto the roof and the brush is just used to agitate that chemical which will help it foam up as you can see. This helps it stick to the roof more as it's a natural surfactant. So what I'm doing here is I'm applying the biocide solution to the roof. Now this is diluted at 25 to 1 with water so for every one litre of biocide I use 25 litres of water to dilute it ensuring I'm covering every square inch of this roof, making sure it's completely soaked in. A lot of mistakes people make is not putting enough on and they're left with a very patchy roof. So it's really important to get complete coverage and make sure all of the tiny little gaps are completely soaked. So if you don't fill all of the gaps on the roof with the chemical, then the moss will regrow with a vengeance. The important part is making sure anything organic on this roof is completely absorbing this chemical. So once the biocide completely soaks and dries in, you would never even know it was on there and your results will start to come after a few weeks. The main thing is trusting in the chemical because it definitely will do its job. So it's important to have your roof cleaned because the buildup of moss will over time damage the tiles on the roof, which can lead to cracks, damp, leak, all sorts of issues in your home that you really don't want happening. And if the problem is not treated early enough, then it can lead to very expensive roof repairs in the future. As far as time scale on how often should my roof be cleaned, it is pretty much a one-time deal for the majority of the process as long as it's being kept on top of. And in future, it would just be a light chemical treatment just to keep anything at bay. So the first step is getting it done and then it's a case of maintaining it. Even the household appliances we use to keep things neat, like washing machines, need to be cleaned. Back inside the home, we see what it takes to remove the buildup of detergent and softener that can wear down machines if not cleaned properly. Hi, I'm Derek Dennis. I specialize in repairing and cleaning washing machines, dryers, any major appliances. The two main types of washing machines that I work on are top loaders and front loaders. I'm gonna show you how I clean them. So this top load washer is, I would say, between 15 and 17 years old. This machine here hasn't been cleaned, I would say, ever since it was purchased. The biggest problem with this, the abundance of buildup from, you know, excessive use of detergent, fabric softener, all the buildup you see, that's what causes this big ring around the top. The water doesn't come up that high. That's why you see the different levels. And then, you know, the buildup of mold, the perfect ideal circumstance for, for mold and mildew buildup is moisture, darkness, and heat. So common buildup in these machines due to overuse of high efficiency detergent and fabric softener, which you don't need. This big buildup, you're gonna get rust, you're gonna get mold, mildew. Two tablespoons of high efficiency detergent and no fabric softener will make your machine last ages longer than if you're dumping a cup or two of fabric softener in. It do doesn't get your clothes any cleaner. I highly recommend cutting out fabric softener in your laundry regimen. The reason that I'm so against fabric softener is when you use fabric softener, the reason that it works is the reason that it's bad. So it builds up like an oily residue because those enzymes have been trapped inside your shirt. And so that's what causes it to smell. So it's not because of you, but eventually the overuse of high efficiency detergent and fabric softener will cause your clothes to smell even if they're clean. So anytime we maintenance the machine, we want to make sure that we're unplugging it from any power source and it's good to cut the water off. So generally we start from top to the bottom. The main thing is removing the tub and cleaning the inner and outer baskets. That's where all of your smell comes from. With these direct drive machines, a lot of times we have the legs are rusty and we'll either scrape them down, repaint them, make sure we knock the cobwebs out, all that kind of stuff. Sometimes we'll find a little baby stock. You never know. We like to use toothbrushes, different um, different style brushes. You have pointy brushes, flat brushes. They all have different jobs, but brushes are, are, are very key. They're vital to everything we do. So the brushes really help to get in there and you know kind of get in the corners and the crevices to clean all this mildew and mold out. Sometimes the pressure washer doesn't get inside the balance ring and we have to some bristles in there and 
kind of really put some elbow grease in it. My favorite cleaner is Pine Saw, Bleach, Lysol. Vinegar is more of what I recommend for people to use through a washing cycle. White distilled vinegar has acetic compounds that help kill some bacterias. When we pressure wash, first we start the outside. We can get a lot better into the balance ring. A pressure washer, the water finds its ways into all the crevices and it does a much better job at pushing out all this mold and mildew and detergent buildup and fabric softener buildup all the way out of the holes. And we can just rinse it out of the inside and we have pretty much a brand new basket. So the steam cleaning comes usually comes after the pressure washing just because we want to get kind of a final clean. The best thing about the steamer is, you know, the water comes out at a super high temperature and that helps to effectively sanitize any of these crevices or cracks or anything that we can't just clean with a pressure washer or bleach. So the front load of the cleaning process, it's similar, but it's a lot different in the disassembly and just the orientation of the basket. I can't remove a basket all the way from a front loader. I can only clean the front half. The old school top loaders are built like tanks. The front loaders are not, but they clean your clothes better. They generally don't need as much cleaning as a top loader because of the orientation and the way the water uh, spins inside. And the water actually keeps the tubs cleaner. Uh, the biggest part of the smell that we see is from pump building up lint and debris in there and people not clean it out and then you stay with a smell or because people don't wipe out their uh, their door seal every time they use the machine they keep the door closed and then that just builds up a mildew smell as long as you keep the door open and, and wipe the door seal out and you know run a washing a washer cleaner tablet through once a month or so so white distilled vinegar it's not going to smell i can guarantee it so with this front loader, it actually has a clean out spot for the lint. This is what protects your pump and this is what keeps helps keep the smell down internally. Pull the door down, we drain the water out of this little, this is a drain hose that actually pulls whatever water is left inside the pump. And then we take the filter out, clean it out, and that's it, it's that simple. I recommend doing this every 30 days, at least every six months, and this is gonna prevent odor. It's gonna keep, the, it's gonna keep your washing machine lasting a whole lot longer. The average lifespan of pretty much any washer is two and three years before the bearings go out, you know, just because of, and that really comes from the overuse of, of detergent. So when a detergent breaks down that oil and grease, it'll cause the bearings to get rusted, rusty, and then your washing machine will sound like a jet plane taking off. That's bad bearings. It's really hard to get to if you can't physically tear these things down and clean them yourself. So the best thing to do is preventive maintenance. Two tablespoons of detergent, no fabric softener at all, but if you have to use it, make sure you dilute it by 50%. You know, when I sell a machine to somebody, I want them to have the faith that I have sold them the cleanest used washing machine that they can possibly buy. Finally, we have the dry vents. These can become packed with lint and dust with regular use over time. Here's how the professionals tackle the job. My name is Aaron Cotton, and I am the owner and operator of Dry Vent Superheroes of New Orleans. My name is Sophia Giordano Scott. I am the co owner and business manager of Dryer Vent Superheroes of New Orleans. Today, we're going to look at how to clean out a dusty dryer vent. The main thing that gets basically conglomerated in the vent pipes is a lot of either dead skin cells, pet hair, children's glitter, regular hair, just dust, dry detergent, anything that can stay and stick on our clothes that can come off in the wash. The worst is always going to be any pet clinics. You're cleaning towels daily, and you're not just cleaning towels, but you're cleaning towels full of pet hair, which is usually thicker and coarser and sometimes more oily than um, human hair. The metal brush not only breaks it up, but it kind of catches as well. So it caught all that hair, and you can see as I pull it out, it's just almost a whole dog that it seems yeah. like I pull out. It was literally just mounds of hardened pet hair and lint inside all the way to the exit and then that exit had about four feet of bird's nest just compacted at that end because there was no vent cover on the end it was just an open tube so it took us about two hours to clean the vent in entirety get everything out. We scoped it with our little camera about six times trying to make sure we got every little piece out of there. As the lint just gets stuck in there and it builds over time, the heat can't get out, so the heat just stays there just and it and accumulates right there and it condenses. And that's actually how a fire will start. 
part of our inspection when we first go in is to make sure is this vent connected within the wall we only use these types of vents they are metal but also flexible but they're the only type of connection hose vents that can actually contain a fire as opposed to the foil vents if you look on the back of your dryer most dryers will say don't use a foil vent and most people just don't read that warning we get behind the dryer and we take the metal tube that's behind the dryer and we take it off and we inspect to make sure that uh, the inside is either dirty or clean because you either want to clean it out or replace it. The second step would be to put our rods with the brushes into the wall with the camera. We can see inside the wall of what's going on and the customer can see as well of either how dirty or how clean it is. You can definitely tell almost how long it's been because if it's only been like a year or two, maybe like a little or nothing at all. But when we're getting to like the three to five years or plus, you're getting literal mounds of stuff that's coming out. You know, it's almost like from a molehill to a mountain of stuff that you're getting out and you're like, wow. It gets really gross if it's, if it's 10 plus years. So after we inspect it and see how dirty it is, then we take our brushes with our rods. So that goes inside the wall and our drill basically just cleans everything out. We call this the vent polisher brush. It has this metal teeth at the end. So when that goes through your vent, that's gonna polish your vents as well as clean it. So it's gonna make it even harder for lint to stick in the future. When we take our hub and filter vacuum cleaner, we make sure that no dust gets in the air for either us or the customer to breathe in. No cleaning solutions or chemicals, just the, the brushes and the HEPA filter vacuum cleaner really does the job. And then once all that's done and clean, we turn towards the inside of the dryers. We uh, get all the lint that might have been stuck in there. We uh, go back and we take our aluminum tube here and we put everything back from the wall to the dryer. We do use heat safe tape on all of our repairs or connection hoses. We do also use clamps. The reason why we use both is because you want your dryer vent to be able to be unhooked every year and cleaned. And we push the dryer back and then we check under the lint trap we definitely found a lot of weird stuff coming from the dryers, especially under the lint trap. I've had one employee, as we were cleaning, he pulled out a whole silver chain. I found money, uh, like $5 and a couple $1 bills. And then of course we get the not so fun stuff, bird eggs and wasp nests. That's usually towards the outside of the house, not like in the dryer itself. Also storm damage. Whenever we have a bad storm, hurricane, and um, something gets impacted in the vent or the roof comes off or something, you're probably going to get water in your vent, in which case you need a professional to come and take that out because it's going to be really nasty water mixed in with all that lint. So we've had uh, multiple customers tell us, I've been in this house for over 10 years and I haven't even thought about cleaning it out. And they're like, why are my clothes still wet? A lot of the times it's not your dryer, it's in fact that the line is just clogged up with all the lint and hair and everything. The most important thing to do with keeping up your dryer vent is definitely to get that annual professional cleaning. But um, in addition to that, cleaning your lint trap with every use is the biggest one. I would say the most satisfying is leaving with the customers all happy and smiling and knowing that they're safe, uh, that their house is safe and that their product is gonna work as they want it to.